Hello, everybody. We are ready to begin our long day of very exciting events. And I hope the Transformation Education Summit, UNESCO's uh, summit is going well. Uh, I hope that this will, this day's discussions will invigorate you and make you think about things that uh, have been out of your realm. And maybe we can have much more of a uh, you know, wider discussion as we go towards our networking session. So welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Radhika Anger at the Center for Sustainable Development. I work with Professor Sachs on education uh, related work, especially SDG 4.7. I'm also the chair of Mission 4.7, which is a group of collectives, a group of organizations that have come together to join forces on making SDG 4.7 possible. And we have our esteemed partners here. We have Monica from uh, the Ban Ki Moon Center. She's a very vital part of our collaboration. We have UNESCO, we have uh, SDSN and Center for Sustainable Development and Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences. Um, in the morning, I was uh, with a lot of uh, students, eco ambassadors that we call. And one of them who is a fifth grader is actually, I think is a philosopher, but is still in fifth grade. Um, she said something that makes me repeat what she said. So she was saying that, you know, let's not worry about plastic. Let's not worry about cutting trees. The problem is us. The crisis is us. Let us worry about ourselves. And I want to take it one level further by saying that the crisis it can be resolved and let's think of this crisis constantly so that we become the solutions also. So hopefully the panels today, panel one and two, will help us to become uh, the solution maker. Here you are seeing these posters, turn it around card, uh, Professor Veta Salova is sitting in the crowd here who's managed to get all these youth voices. Let's get those youth voices in, uh, internalize them and see what we can do to combine our forces to resolve those issues, climate related issues that we have uh, amongst us now. So with that, I want to um, also suggest that we have two panels. So please stay over for both the panels. Panel one is on um, a ministerial panel, which will be contributing towards policies and commitment on SDG 4.7. And the second panel is taking that discussion on SDG 4.7 to a deeper level and linking it to social emotional learning and happiness work that our, uh, uh, one of our SDSN groups has been focusing on happiness council. The first panel is organized by mission 4.7. Um, before we get on to the discussions of the panel, uh, we have a very special guest. She is our education task force member and is a very important think leader in our group, uh, Leslie Udwin. She's here, she uh, runs Think Equal and she's actually practicing the two panels that we will be discussing today. She has a program in place that links both of them, SDG 4.7 with social emotional learning and she will be, she has a very special message for us and she'll be showcasing her work with us. Leslie, we are so happy that you are, uh, we are honored that you are here. Please, if you can come here and uh, share your news. Thank you. The honor is all mine. Honorable ministers, distinguished guests, and friends and colleagues. It is a great privilege, an honor and a joy to have been tasked with celebrating and presenting to you a flagship program for Mission 4.7's transformative quality education. The flagship is Think Equal, which is an early years education program in furtherance of targets 4.7 and 4.2, and which understands that it is the early years and brain building during that period that is the gateway to sustainable development for people and planet. This flagship program mediates transformative education for well being for psychosocial and socio-emotional intelligence, social justice, and peace. And 
it builds the platform, the foundation for our children at the very time that the architecture of their brains is being built. We know from 60 plus years of evaluations by preeminent scientists that what happens to us in our first six years of life shapes the rest of our lives and hopefully the 80 that follow. We launch this flagship program at a time when one in six of our children is suffering from diagnosable mental health disorders post pandemic. And when the other pandemics of violence, discrimination, greed, and despair are raging relentlessly. And so what better time than this to announce a positive, hope-filled announcement that the visionary and enlightened education ministry of Belize Honorable Education Minister Fonseca, Honorable Secretary of State for Education, Zabane, and the wonderful Diane Castillo Mahia, CEO for Education of Belize, have committed to adopting and implementing this flagship program of Mission 4.7 in their national curriculum to reach every single child of four to five in infant one throughout the entire country of Belize. Now, they have recently created an excellent competency-based curriculum in Belize, but they're not content to just sit back and let this theoretical document, though eloquent, though excellent, carry the work. It can't do that and it won't do that. So they diligently with their impassioned hearts and their duty of care fulfilled to their youngest, most vulnerable citizens have decided that they will capacitate and equip their teachers with the very tools, the resources, the lesson plans, the narrative picture books, one a week, 30 weeks, three times a week of this concrete, tangible expression of those lists of outputs and objectives. They know that that is how you achieve mindset change and positive life outcomes. Deepest gratitude must be expressed here to Think Equals Partners, UNICEF, they are exceptional leaders in this field, alongside, of course, our cherished, beloved UNESCO. Um, and they know that theory without actionable practice at the coalface in the classroom doesn't carry much meaning. This program is evidence-based, three RCTs across three countries as disparate as Botswana, Colombia, and Australia have proved powerful impact, and indeed that the greater the deficit, the greater the impact in the child. And they've, they've done so in terms of proving increases in pro-social and decreases in antisocial behaviors and attitudes like anger, aggression, anxiety, withdrawal. And this program is so inexpensive that it's been possible for one individual, our cherished Jennifer Gross, who is on the high level advisory committee of Mission 4.7, to partner and single-handedly fund the entire country. It is so inexpensive that in the country I come from, England, the cost of giving this program to transform the lives of every single child in the whole of England equates to the cost of incarcerating 88 violent offenders for one year. So 
have we learned that it's better to prevent than make futile attempts to cure? Have we learned that it's not enough to just talk now about reimagining education? We have to repurpose education. It is an institution that was designed in and for the Industrial Revolution. It's no longer fit for purpose and must be overhauled and repurposed. And Belize is doing just that. Please, all of you, applaud Belize for their boldness, their courage, and their enlightenment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leslie. That was so inspiring to see that solutions are with us and we are practicing those solutions. With that, we'll start with our ministerial panel on contributing transforming education summit uh, to the uh, transforming education summit. And we'll uh, have the ministerial uh, panel soon. We want to start with our keynote, two very special keynote uh, addresses. First by Ban Ki Moon, he's the UN uh, former Secretary General and patron for Mission 4.7. We have a recorded message. He's in Korea right now. And uh, so glad that he was able to spare time to uh, share this message with us. Distinguished ministers, your excellencies, dear partners and co-organizers, dear participants, I'm pleased to welcome you to the ministerial panel on transforming education for prosperity, people, and the planet at Columbia University in contribution to the Transforming Education Summit. The Sustainable Development Goals are our common blueprint for a prosperous, inclusive, and environmentally sustainable future. When the SDGs were established, it was clear that to achieve this ambitious agenda, ensuring access to equality education, is essential. On the SDG 4, target 4.7, calls for the implementation of education that is inclusive and promotes sustainable development. It underlines the need to foster global citizenship and empower all learners in taking action to achieve the SDGs. I'm honored to act as patron of Mission 4.7, together with the Honorable Audrey Ajule, Director General of UNESCO. Mission 4.7 is a joint effort of global leaders from different sectors who advocate for transformative education. Its members understand the need for more governmental commitments to introduce global citizenship education and education for sustainable development into nationwide curricula. At the same time, teachers should receive support to teach transformative education in classrooms around the world. Humanity is facing a multitude of challenges from climate change to a global pandemic, to economic crisis, and active wars. To meet these challenges, we must equip learners of all ages with the global citizenship knowledge, competencies, values, and skills to navigate a better future for all. I'd like to thank the ministers joining today's session for their commitment and leadership for transformative education, global citizenship, and sustainable development. They are acting as trailblazers for policy solutions that promote SDG target 4.7 and will hopefully inspire many others to follow their shining example. I wish you the best for this event and your discussions about transforming education for prosperity, people, and planet. Thank you for committing to a better future for all, leaving no one behind. Thank you.
With those truly remarkable, inspiring words, uh, we will now turn to another keynote speaker who is very, very special and who is leading this effort of transforming education at UNESCO. So UNESCO is Assistant Secret uh, Director General of Education, Stefania Gianni, and also uh, Co-Chair of Mission 4.7. Stefania, can I ask you to please come here and share your words? Thank you so much. Uh, great to be here. I would say the right place to be <laughs> at the right time with the right people in the room. So I'm very happy uh, coming from these uh, two very intensive uh, days, uh, discussing, planning about how we can better and more cooperate to transform education, to transform society. And Columbia University, uh, you know, everybody knows the reputation, the long-standing commitment to contribute in the humanities as many other sectors, but now more recently, uh, thanks to the strong engagement of our dear friend, colleague, uh, Jeffrey Sachs is really very much uh, walking the talk about these topics we are discussing. And just coming immediately after, another father of SDGs and SDG4 in particular, His Excellency, the former Secretary General of the UN, Ban Ki-moon, just recognizing the role of Ban Ki-moon Center in this business, I think it's a great honor, a great pleasure for me. Well, let me focus, uh, as the, is, a, is a very complex uh, topic, but I'm sure we share more or less uh, some ideas, some vision, and how to move together ahead. I think that 4.7 is really the engine of transformation of uh, SDG4 agenda. This is a target which actually captures um, the transformational ethos of the agenda as a whole and the power of education to touch upon mindset, awareness, and behaviors. We know that um, SDGs are not only about shifting uh, priorities and financing. Despite the very strong, uh, passionate, and touching commitment to work on financing that Jeffrey Sachs brought to our attention yesterday morning, many of you were there, I'm sure, I would say that the financial gap, which is a huge problem, is not the, maybe the most important one. Money are there if you want to keep money to prioritize education. I would say that the other important gap we are addressing, I see here on the front row, uh, Minister Niki Kerameos leading so greatly the digital initiative, which is coming out from this summit, the digital divide, which is the second huge important challenge we have, is very important that we have a, a good roadmap to, to develop together, but still maybe it's not the real crucial core of what transformation is about. The real gap we have to fill as much as possible is the knowledge and values gap, the knowledge and values divide, which is still around the world. And of course, these dimensions are all interconnected. Let me focus presenting the UNESCO perspective and the contribution that we are giving to this uh, unprecedented global mobiliz mobilization from countries, the UN agencies and all partners which has been run through the last six months through some uh, 154 national consultations that are already bringing out bottom up the perspective from education communities, ministers, and uh, all people and stakeholders involved. National consultations uh, report uh, that called 
that that um, so the, the, the analysis we are doing of these national statements and commitment prepared for the summit finds that a large majority of countries place emphasis on renewing curricula content and methods to make them more fitting to the purpose to contemporary issues as uh, the previous speakers already said uh, uh, a model which has been established in many countries well structure i mean uh, centuries ago is not more appropriate and also the pre-summit organized in June at UNESCO, where many of you as ministers, 154, another unprecedented record number, talking about their own needs, their own ways to transform a national level, highlighted the crucial role that education must play to transform societies, if and only if we address this important point fill in the gap, the knowledge and values divide. So transforming education means for us, quoting from UNESCO perspective documents, empowering learners with the knowledge, the skills, the values and attitudes to care. This is the learning to care that we need in this century. And the Futures of Education report, which has been released uh, uh, last year with a kind of a pioneering uh, approach to the Transforming Education Summit, actually, among other important messages, is providing the international community this important message, call for a new model which puts the, the culture of caring at the very center caring for the planet, because the planet, the earth, as there is there a nice motto, is what we have, <laughs> actually. Caring for others, because we cannot absolutely ignore the increasing number of uh, contests of conflicts, war, intolerance, discrimination, democracies being at stake. And caring of uh, the new dimension where human beings have to deal with technology first, including artificial intelligence and the ethics of artificial intelligence to be part of the equation. So it's about uh, making education systems resilient, adapt to an uncertain and complex future while actively and creatively contributing to the well being. Of people and the planet. Well being is a notion that, I mean, very ambitious. It includes happiness, it includes freedom, it includes all the conditions that, as individuals and society, have the right to keep alive. And education is a kind of tool on one side and is a kind of goal on the other side. So you will see if you share. This vision, if you agree with me, I mean, we have a really very, very challenging and demanding task, colleagues. How can we transform uh, this uh, beautiful uh, agenda in concrete actions which can have an impact on the ground? As you know, UNESCO, uh, you know, has been established uh, 75 years ago, six now, I think celebrated the anniversary last year, to build the peace in women, in men's mind, women in men's mind. So at the very core of the mandate of this organization is really very much this agenda. And uh, the, the transformative approach we see is not simply an add uh, on, uh, on specific subjects, which are of course very much important for us. We launch also tomorrow in the spotlight sessions, the Greening uh, Education uh, Initiative, which will call countries to commit to include the climate change and uh, environment, uh, natural knowledge in curricula in a very permanent and structural way. 
we also will bring out the importance of global citizenship education, which is already a very, very well done structure framework that many countries are developing. I wish to acknowledge and commend Belize. I was yesterday in the, in the panel and listened to uh, the minister uh, uh, explaining the ambitious action plan. But beyond that, we have to think of an holistic and comprehensive approach, which must go beyond specific subjects. And let me give to you some good news. Awareness is growing. We had around the world on the importance of this approach. During the most recent consultation UNESCO ran on the implementation of an historic recommendation, the 1974, I'm sure some of you are aware of uh, what is about, quoting the title is a long one, recommendation for international understanding, cooperation and peace and education relating to human rights and fundamental freedoms. Now for us are common language, but they've been uh, agreed at intergovernmental governmental uh, level uh, in the uh, 70s, 1974. So now all countries reported that education for sustainable development and global citizenship are reflected in their laws and policies, curricula and teacher education. So it's an awareness which is growing around the world. And while we are reviewing this recommendation, including new updated dimensions, we are happy to see that a progress has been made. Nonetheless, uh, uh, other research reminds us that there is a deep disconnect between the policy and practice. For instance, our global teacher survey clearly state that 70% of uh, teachers declare not to be equipped, not to be prepared to touch upon some subject like uh, uh, anti-Semitism, uh, like uh, discrimination, violence, uh, and peace, or absence of peace were in the classroom. So this is why we need to push forward and work together, strengthen our partnerships, the right people at the right place, in the, at the right time in the room, to transform how learning is organized uh, through these all of institution approaches that actively involve youth, communities, and indigenous cultures and voices. Let me highlight this point. Indigenous culture and voice are not something to speak about when there is a big conference. They must be a permanent per presence and voice within uh, the global and national discussion and reforms. The second point, of course, it's in it's crucial and timely to renew curricula in order they can emphasize what Pope Francis called the ecological approach to education, given a very, very important relevance to social emotional, intercultural, intergenerational learning. Third and last point, investing in teachers must be really a huge priority from high quality initial training and professional development to their direct involvement in transformation. Well, this is a roadmap. This is the plan. This is the, the commitment we have colleagues. We are partnering in crimes. This is one of the most important one. I mean, if we'll be able at the end of this week, next week now, to have uh, not only 65 uh, heads of state and governments tomorrow commit me, committing at the UN uh, uh, to transform uh, their national system, which is already an historic unprecedented uh, uh, record number. But if we'll be able to bring to our territories, to our communities, to our uh, leadership, some of these, uh, uh, concrete uh, actions, I think that financial gap will be partially addressed because people can also 
you know, contribute financially when they see that there is a, a real good purpose. Digital gap and divide will be another part of the story, but most importantly, will contribute effectively to fill the knowledge and values gap that this world needs to have filled to work better. Thank you very much. I think Madam Janani has given us the roadmap. Now it's our time to take action. And the panel, first panel is taking the action panel. So I'm so happy to invite all our ministers, please, to come and take a seat here. And uh, also inviting Dina Bookbinder. She is a maverick in education and has been uh, looking at transforming education since she was 24, where she founded education for sharing, something that we heard uh, Stefani also mentioning uh, also. So I will give the floor to her. She's also the chair and uh, board of United Nations Youth Associations Mexico and no other person to chair and to moderate this session other than uh, Dina. Thank you, Dina. Thank you so much. In Mexico, we say, Mi casa es tu casa. My home is your home. This might sound familiar to all of you. And a transforming education should be everybody's home. So my name is Ina. I am thrilled to be here with all of you. Thank you so much. Mission 4.7. Honorable Ban Ki-moon, Honorable Stefania Giannini, Honorable Professor Jeffrey Sachs for creating Mission 4.7 and for organizing this exquisite event with a distinguished panel, very diverse and rich. Thank you for being here, Honorable Ministers and Representatives of your countries. His Excellency Dr. Yao Osei Adutum, Minister of Education from Ghana, her Excellency Joanna Sumubori, State Secretary to the Minister for Foreign Affairs from Finland. Her Excellency Niki Karameus, Minister for Education and Religious Affairs from Greece. Her Excellency Agnes Nialonje, Minister of Education from Malawi. Thank you. Efkaristo, Kitos, Medasi, Gracias, Gamsamida, Grazie, Sikomo. Thank you also to the audience in person and to those connected via live stream. I couldn't think of a better place to talk about how to advance the SDGs through education than a, than a university. It's universities like Columbia that have the values necessary to address the SDGs. Here is where we need to talk about this. Thank you for hosting us. Now, there is a reason why I was invited to moderate this panel. I, I serve in the education task force of Mission 4.7 and the organization that I founded 15 years ago, Education for Sharing, precisely has the mission of raising better global citizens through the power of play. Yes, we translate the sustainable development goals and civic values and social emotional skills through a play, reflect, and take action methodology to support millions of teachers' development, to empower all learners to become agents of change, leaving no one behind. We translate the SDGs so that into play so that kids from all ages will understand firsthand why should they care about these great global challenges and what can they do from their local communities and the role they have to play. So I look forward to playing with all of you <laughs> about your favorite SDG one day. Today we have very short, short time. In 15 years, we have had the privilege of working hand in hand with ministers of education from around the world, like yourselves and, and their teams. And we know the incredible challenges that you face every single day. We're also ready to team up with you. 
Today, I'd like to ask you for a brief moment to go back to your childhood and think, what is it? What was it like when you went to school? When you were seven years old, for example, imagine your classroom. What do you see? What do you feel? What do you hear? And what do you smell? What brought you joy? What was challenging? And what motivated you from those experiences so that today you have taken initiatives that can actually transform education? With that in mind, and talking about challenges, I will invite you to, in five minutes each, to address issues like your country's approach to transformative education as enshrined in SDG target 4.7, the role of governments in transforming education, and in that, what other stakeholders does your ministry work with to ensure that transformation actually occurs? An education policy or program that you're most proud of, and why? And some challenges that you faced implementing these transformative policies, and how have you addressed them? And last but not least, any advice you could share with your fellow education ministers regarding transformative education for the SDGs. I would love to start with your, His Excellency, Dr. Yao Oseya Dutum, Minister of Education from Ghana. I can see their faces. Can I stand? Is it possible to stand? Or? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, thank you. All in five minutes? <laughs> Please. <laughs> Everything you Show us it's possible. Wow. Uh, thank you so much. It's a great opportunity to be here this afternoon. I'm so grateful that I was invited to this event as a Minister for Education in Ghana. I'm proud to be among the panelists here. Uh, this afternoon, you've asked me to address, uh, it means I have to now repurpose, repackage, and make sure I can hit a point in regards to what you want me to say. But I just want you to know that I, before I became Minister for Education, I live in Los Angeles and taught in the Los Angeles Unified School District. And then after 10 years of teaching for LA Unified School District as a mathematics teacher, I, I got um, adventurous and began a journey in the development of a charter school. And I developed a new design charter schools in Los Angeles. Now we have three campuses in LA. And it was there that um, the current president came to America, visited there, saw me and said, would you consider coming back to Ghana to help me change the education system? He couldn't believe that a Ghanaian would be building schools in South LA. <laughs> <laughs> so after I told him all that I was doing and how I got to become a charter school developer, he said, I'm introducing free senior high school in Ghana. America was the first country that championed free education for all and use that to democratize their system and transform their fortunes. So I want you to come to Ghana, share with me and share with us the American experience and change the education system for me. Um, it wasn't easy responding to that call, but I decided to go. And I became, uh, he made me deputy minister for education after four years. He said, hey, why don't you become the minister uh, for education? Why don't you bring some of the American ideas to bear? in our transformation agenda. As I sit here and hear about the SDG goals and talk about uh, the gap between um, the knowledge and values and how do you transform that space, we're lucky we're beginning a new curriculum and we're able to infuse the SDG goals into it. Uh, so in terms of the curriculum, whilst we implement, we're also uh, implementing the SDGs goals in terms of the values, uh, caring for people and all those things that really matter. But I also know that in a developing country like Ghana, in order for you to create a transformative education system, you have to begin to understand that you need some leapfrogging strategies. The government decided that we wanted every student to go to senior high school. 60 years after independence, high school, upper secondary was just the preserve of the rich. If you are poor, you could not go. How do we create all the spaces necessary for everybody to go? We have to go to California. We have to look at year-round schools. And we implemented year-round schools in Ghana. That means we divided all the students into three tracks. At any point in time, two of them are in school. We were then able to create space for every single child to go to senior high school. So as I speak with you, we began with 
when before Free City High School, there were only about, or the introduction of year round schools, only 800,000 students were in school. When we removed the cost barrier and increased access through year round schools, we've been able to grow secondary enrollment from 800,000 to 1.3 million. We have also increased gender parity. Before the introduction of free senior high school, parents in deprived communities had to make a, had to make a choice between the girl going to high school or the boy. Mm -hmm. Invariably, it was the boy. So our uh, uh, gender parity at the time was 0.92, 9.99. Next year, there will be a gender parity in Ghana at the secondary education level, all because we're able to use leapfrogging strategies for access. Because if you don't, you're going to sit there and lament and say, oh, developing country, no buildings, we can't do this. But when you begin to think about leapfrogging strategies, when a sense of agency is created, you begin to borrow from around the world, then what was deemed impossible then become possible. So instead of saying, I don't have buildings, begin to think, why not year-run schools? Why can't you reduce the enrollment of students in a classroom through year-run school concept? Because even if in California, um, a developed nation, a state in a developed nation in 1994, uh, when high school became four years, they had to use year round. Then we could also use them, and that's what we are doing. Beyond that, we've also used technology and open education resource in transforming our education system. Uh, communities without access to the internet has what we call the iBox. It, it's a server that emits local Wi Fi, and with that, students can access quality content. That is in that box that we call the eyeballs, made in Ghana uh, for Ghana. And that is breaking frontiers. STEM education is being boosted through virtual uh, labs. So instead of waiting for a well lab to be constructed, we are able to have uh, this quality labs, virtual labs developed, and schools have access to them. And where there's no internet, they use the eyeballs for connectivity so that they can use lab activities. So we know that we need to boost STEM education. We know we don't have all the resources. Then we uh, look at technology to see how we bring about that, that transformation. Adult education is now being implemented in Ghana. It was never done, now we are doing it. So those who could not get access to go to secondary school during their time now have access through adult education through an agency called the Complementary Education Agency. So in the case of Ghana, like many other develop, can, developing countries, when we are talking about ed, SDG goals, we have it's a major decision to make in terms of how do we even allow the students to be in their seats so that we can talk about SDG. If they are not going to school, how do you educate them the way the SDGs want us to educate them? We also have two universities that focus on environment and sustainable development and everything about those institutions, about the, how the country meets the SDG goals. So there are major, major things taking place. And you said an advice to other ministers. So let me jump there. When I became Minister for Education in Ghana, one of the things I realized was that uh, the Ghanaian education system, unlike the US, is more specialized at the upper secondary. When you get to the upper secondary, you either do general arts, that means you are not doing serious science subject. You may also do visual arts, um, and, and you are boxed in. Once you do visual arts, university do not allow you to do engineering. They think you don't have the foundation for it. And as a result, we are not able to increase the number of students who pursue engineering. Even if you counsel them, the universities will not allow them. So I have this story that I always tell, that there's this young man called Kwejo. Kwejo had a dream and God was speaking to him. And God told him, Kwejo, you're going to be the best engineer in the world. And then Kwejo says, God, it's not possible. No, no, not possible at all. And then God said, I created you. I know it's possible. I said, no, no, no. God, it will never be possible. And God said, why? He said, I'm a young man growing up in Ghana. In high school, I'm pursuing the visual arts pathway. The universities will never allow me to do engineering. Mm -hmm. But what Kojo didn't know was that God knew he was going to travel to America. And when he comes to America, the universities will not tell him you cannot do engineering. They will give him the opportunity to prove himself. He can go to a community college, take math and science and physics courses. And if he does well, he can become an engineer. So in Ghana, what I decided to do was that I was going to create an incentive program for universities that would love to do pre-engineering. And I was going to give them grants the same way that I got my grants to do charter school. So with the grant, 
I was going to incentivize them to do something that they would never do. So I published in the newspapers that any university that want to do pre-engineering can apply for the grant. All of them applied. And at the end, I only have resources for two universities. And today, Kojo's dream is possible. Students are now pursuing pre-engineering in Ghana, and they did not do science at the upper secondary level. So I believe that we have to find a way to get people to do what they would normally not do, instead of saying this is not possible in a developing country. The American system allows people to be incentivized to do so many things that I would not do normally. If I didn't get a grant, I wouldn't have opened a charter school. I couldn't have done it. But the federal grant that I got enabled me to develop a charter school. So now we have Ghanaian University that can't wait next year to start pre-engineering, something nobody ever thought would happen in Ghana. So I believe it's just a way finding a new way, a new approach, incentivize people to get them to do things that they typically will not do. We have an opportunity in Ghana. We have students who are so respectful. They sit in the classroom, do everything you tell them to do. You enter the classroom, they will stand up. Unless you tell them to sit, they won't say, wow, different. <laughs> From South Los Angeles, <laughs> very, very different. <laughs> so I always tell people that if you cannot, make the Ghanaian education system one of the best in the world, then is the, prob the problem is with the adults who are in charge of the education system and not the children. So we are making great strides and we are making great progress in Ghana. I believe we'll transform our education system to compete with the rest of the world. We have children who are ready to learn. They are begging us, can you teach me? In South LA, I have to beg the children, can I please teach you? I remember one student who were, who was sleeping in my class and I, I woke him up in, early in the morning at Manuel's High School. I woke him and said, hey, stop, don't, wake up. Why are you sleeping in my class? He looked me up and said, am I bothering you? <laughs> <laughs> he said, look at all the children who are making noise in your class. <laughs> I'm sleeping, am I bothering you? <laughs> Ghanaian students are wide awake and they are saying, bother me, give me the opportunity, I will sell. So I'm excited about, about my work in Ghana and the opportunity that has been given me by Nana Dankwe Kufuado, the president of the Republic of Ghana. Thank you so much. Tremendously inspiring. And I, I, we can't wait to, to visit all those kids yeah. and, and the system in Ghana. And a very entrepreneurial minister, indeed. And, and leapfrogging strategies uh, incentive programs, there is, there is lots to do. And um, thank you so much. And I, I am in the, in the role of, of reminding all panelists to stick to the five minutes, please, uh, so that we can get the most out of this panel. We want to make sure that we, we get everyone's uh, views. We have a lot to share. So um, with that, uh, please, Her Excellency, Ms. Joanna Sumobori, State Secretary to the Minister for Foreign Affairs from Finland, Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you so much, uh, dear participants, dear your excellencies. It's a pleasure to be here, honestly. Thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to explore a bit what kind of um, uh, educational thinking we have in Finland. Uh, UNESCO's uh, Assistant Director Stefania mentioned happiness, and I was very happy to hear that word, because in a fifth time in a row, we have been the happiest country in the world, uh, according to UN rankings. Uh, if you would go to the streets of Helsinki or any other city uh, in Finland, you would ask a random guy or uh, whoever on the streets of Helsinki that, are you happy? Or do you consider that you are the happiest country in the world? They would probably say that, no, it, we can't be the happiest country. How is that possible? Because we have really critical mindset as well when it comes to societal issues. And I think that explains, uh, it's one way to explain why uh, we have such a, such a um, uh, kind of a uh, vigilant uh, societal system. Um, but the factors behind this happiness, uh, it wasn't so much about how happy emotions we have, uh, it was a, a factors uh, that provide people to feel content to their societal system, uh, good governance, uh, certain services such as education or social services or health services. And that contentment, I think, is the, the, the kind of key to this happiness, why we have succeeded in those rankings. 
And it's not something that we are just happy by nature in Finland. It's this, everything has been uh, achieved by deliberate political decisions and investing in, in those issues. So we are not just happy or good in education sector because we happen to be Finns. It's, it's about policies and hard work that how we have actually um, got the system. And uh, yesterday I had a chance to discuss a lot about uh, education. And uh, I always say that Finland was a relatively poor agrarian society uh, uh, after the second world war. And uh, that was the time when we started to invest in, in people. Because uh, as a country of uh, now of 5.5 million people, uh, not so much at that time, it was our benefit, uh, we benefited as a society uh, that we uh, taught everyone to read, for example, uh, girls and boys, uh, poor, and, uh, poor and rich. Uh, it was good for our GDP that we had, we invested in people and human capital. So it's, um, it, it has to be kept in mind that, of course, we can't, you know, just place Finnish model to any other country as such, but we can learn from Finnish experience that we can build society by deliberate choices um, from, from relatively poor uh, circumstances. Uh, yeah, you asked us to recall something that we remember our childhood uh, classroom days. I started my primary school in 1984, uh, 1983 actually, uh, uh, in the west part of Finland. And what I remember that we played a lot, we played a lot. We, we, uh, we had lots of outdoor activities, even in the, we just discussed with my colleagues from the Ministry of Education that even when it was raining, we had our raincoats and uh, rubber boots and we had to play outside. So that's one thing I remember and, and warm school meals. I remember that was a highlight of the day that we had a little break and we had warm school meals every day. And um, that's actually something that I think that has reflected heavily on the whole of society, what we are today the prosperity we are enjoying today, it's uh, partly also because of the education sector and how we have invested in, in that. I'm almost emotional when I talk about this because um, it's such an important issue. Uh, you might wonder why Deputy Minister for Foreign Affairs uh, was talking about education here today. Um, I would say and argue that education for Finland is one of our strongest soft power assets. It's something that we have employed in our development policies. It's something that we are often talking about when meeting other foreign ministers. So it's not only about education, it's, it's about global uh, influence, what we try to have and cooperation we try to have uh, within the sector. Uh, on a more personal note, uh, I have a little background uh, in, the, in education sector myself. Uh, in early 2000s, I was uh, deputy chair of Helsinki Education Board. And we got to decide a, a very con concrete, tangible issues in that board. What kind of school buildings we have to, you know, uh, plan? Or what kind of planning do we have to have on school buildings? Uh, what kind of spaces students need to learn e efficiently? Uh, what kind of resources do we need in the city budget uh, to, to improve uh, the subjective right of a child to get the best learning environment uh, they can? And that was a very good learning. That was a very good learning for me myself, how on, the, on that level, city level, municipal level, the real decisions are made. And, and it also reflects to, I hope to the national, national level decision makers to listen to the, to the local levels as well in education. So uh, with this kind of a little introduction, I would say and argue that uh, Finland strongly believes in the power of SDG4 uh, to transform societies. We know it by heart ourselves. It has transformed us. And uh, education and training, uh, research and innovation are critical in the comprehensive sustainab sustainability transition as well. Uh, and for the development of inclusive and resilient societies. This is why uh, the SDG7, uh, sorry, 4.7, uh, must guide our work uh, now and in the future. For Finland, transformative learning uh, is understood as a combination of knowledge, uh, attitudes, values, and action. It promotes active global citizenship, uh, where everyone is prepared and equipped with the necessary skills to take action uh, for a more sustainable future. We need also uh, this transformative learning for everybody, uh, regardless of their social background or, or religion or age or profession. Uh, as humanity, we, we must learn new things all the time as we go, uh, and we also have to unlearn certain things. Uh, industrial society and its schemes were mentioned earlier uh, in this event, and I think that there's lots of unlearning we have to do uh, from the old ways of thinking and even maybe sometimes teaching. Uh, we have to adapt ourselves. All parts of society need to be harnessed for this transition, and 
education needs to be partnered with civil society as well. That is something that we work quite hard on. This government has made some com commitments to inclusive decision making. So we have promised that we try to include uh, uh, in a consultative manner uh, every stakeholder, other stakeholders in society, decision makers, yes, but also civil society actors, universities and private sector to discuss uh, uh, what are the best ways and models so that our decision making would be fact based. So we firmly have stated in our government program, the, we want to have fact based uh, decision making in place and education sector plays a tremendous role, role in uh, guaranteeing that as well. Um, teachers were mentioned here, which is something that um, I, I would like to say a few words about. In Finland, we truly cherish, uh, respect and value our teachers and our teacher education. Uh, they are the key, teachers are the key pillar in, in good quality education and they are also key in transforming learning communities once they are supported and empowered to innovate and adapt practices. So they must be also recognized as pedagogical experts uh, and key partners in educational planning. So we need teachers wisdom and know-how when we plan education policies. And they also need opportunities for continuous professional development, sharing uh, of good practices and peer learning as well. In Finland, we want to ensure that all citizens are equipped with future skills and we are investing heavily in continuous learning, uh, science and innovation and aimed at raising the educational level of society as a whole. Uh, as this is a key in boosting equity, well-being, and, and green growth as well. Our ambitious goal is that 50% of uh, young adults will have a higher education degree by 2030. And as part of our efforts, we aim at increasing our participation in early childhood education and care. Uh, and we have extended the minimum school leaving age to 18 years. Uh, dear colleagues, um, in Finland, sustainable development is integrated in all levels of our education. Broad-based competencies such as critical thinking and multiliteracy are pivotal uh, when solving global challenges. And, and in Finland, they, uh, these are emphasized in a cross-disciplinary disciplinary manner in our national core curricula. Since the capacity to always learn new things will be the key, learning uh, to le learn, learning to learn is also one of transversal competencies in Finland, starting with early years. Mm. Phenomenon-based learning requires collaboration of teachers and new learning environments as well, which, extend, uh, which extends beyond the classroom. And uh, we have launched a project on sustainability education, which actually invites the entire basic and upper secondary education to integrate sustainability into schools operating, operate, uh, operational culture. Uh, and as one of the major reforms in Finland, we have also recently uh, updated our entire system of continue, continuous education. Uh, the reform is still on, uh, ongoing, but we, uh, it was prepared as a parliamentary process uh, with, with an aim to create the systemic way to re and upskill the working age population. So all this supports our aim uh, in Finland to achieve also carbon neutrality by 2035. I think it's one of the most ambitious targets uh, globally that we have set up for ourselves. I, I, I admit that it's not easy. We have to work really hard, but that's something that we need education sector as well uh, and science, scientific communities and, and, and universities in this work. So to conclude, um, there is a need for creating positive narratives and sustainable hope these days. And, and the message of hope should be also uh, permit our approach to sustainability. Uh, there's a lot of uh, cynicism also uh, in, in, in society, so societies or global discussions, but I think we don't have a afford to be cynical. We have to have hope in, in our minds. And education is also, it's, it's so much more than, uh, it's, it's a fundamental human right, but it's, it's even more. Um, it is a foundation for equity, uh, innovation and prosperity underpinning the entire 2030 agenda, actually. So um, that is why I'm happy that the UN Summit on Transforming Education will recognize education as an investment in sustainable future as well. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Kitos. And so much to learn from, from how Finns have succeeded. Thank you so much. Um, it's not only hard work, it's also um, investing in people, investing in happiness. And, and it's no coincidence that you played when you, were, when you were a girl and that's how you learned. So, so thank you so much for learning. 
um, a lot of richness needs to be digested from all the extraordinary work you're doing. I would love to invite uh, His Excellency Francis Fonseca, Minister of Education, Culture, Science and Technology from Belize. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. It's a great honor and pleasure to, to join you this afternoon. Uh, of course, I wish to acknowledge the distinguished uh, colleague ministers. Uh, thank you to Columbia University for, for hosting us, uh, Mr. Jeffrey Sachs, uh, for your kind invitation. Belize welcomes this opportunity to participate in this most critically important and timely discussion on transforming education in the context of sustainable development. Belize considers itself a leading voice and actor on this issue of our time, sustainable development. This is reflected in our national development agenda in our economic policies and our education sector plan. Belize recently negotiated and announced the Blue Bonds Arrangement, which is a first of its kind, innovatively addressing three global emergencies, sovereign debt, marine conservation, and financing flows to combat climate change. The Blue Bonds Arrangement has established a model for coordinated and transparent conservation governance, integrating state, community, NGO, and private sector best practices. The Blue Bonds Arrangement accelerates Belize's eco-marine conservation programs, elevating the protection of our barrier reef system and protecting 30% of our ocean space. The comprehensive marine spatial plan is fully funded for the benefit of long-term national development, including the well-being of fisher folk, coastal communities, and the pivotal tourism sector. I share this with you to demonstrate to you that we in Belize are fully committed to transforming our country through sustainable development policies and goals. Central to this effort, of course, is education. The Ministry of Education, therefore, plays a lead role in advancing Mission 4.7, Education for Sustainable Development, Global Citizenship Education, Environmental Education, Climate Education, peace and human rights education, equity and inclusion. These are all fundamental components of Belize's education sector plan 2021-2025. The vision statement as set out in that plan states that Belize's education system will be inclusive of high quality, accessible and equitable, technologically driven and capable of fostering the development of good productive citizens. The system will be accountable and effective in providing the support necessary to allow students, regardless of individual or family characteristics, to achieve their full personal and academic potential and to contribute positively to national development. As stated in our plan, curriculum is the foundation of education. On the surface, it is comprised of a list of topics, objectives, and strategies that are used by teachers to deliver content and assist students in developing a prescribed set of skills. But on a deeper level, it is society's way of imparting the knowledge, capacities, beliefs and attitudes that will lead to a desired social and economic state. Therefore, when there is no alignment between the curriculum being delivered 
and the aspirations of the country, education becomes irrelevant and national development is compromised. The world changes at a rapid pace. And so what we teach and learn and how we teach and learn must constantly evolve. This reality calls for building adaptability, innovation and resilience. Therefore, curriculum, instruction and assessment must be designed to promote deep learning, to focus on what students are able to do with the knowledge that they acquire and the extent to which they are able to think critically and to solve problems in a healthy, productive and sustainable manner. Furthermore, curriculum, instruction and assessment must be aligned to each other. They must integrate technology to increase impact and they must be relevant to the needs of students and to national development. Now, Leslie has given a very impassioned plea for early childhood education and think equal. And I want to add my voice very loudly to that plea. Uh, in Belize, we have embraced Think Equal. Uh, we believe that investing in early childhood education is one of the best investments that you can make in education. As Leslie, as, as Leslie so rightly pointed out, those investments are reflected at every other level of the education system. So it's critically important for all of us to understand and appreciate the critical importance in, of investing in those early formative years uh, where we do have an opportunity um, to guide the value system of our, of our children. So we join very clearly the call for governments, policymakers, education communities uh, to adopt the Think Equal program. We support strongly Pope Francis's call for an ecological approach to education. And of course, when we talk about prosperity, um, prosperity, people and the planet, uh, these are all interlinked. The reality is that we cannot have one without the other. There can be no prosperity unless we are investing in our people and investing in the future of our planet. So those are critically important. And equally in closing, equally important to transformative education is ensuring that as governments, we are recognizing and prioritizing underserved sectors. For us in education in Belize, this means that we are enacting policies and investing resources in early childhood education, special education and student welfare, including a national healthy start feeding program. We are particularly proud of our education upliftment project, Together We Rise, which provides a comprehensive targeted intervention for students and schools in vulnerable at-risk communities. Overall wraparound services include provision of school meals, uniforms, footwear, school supplies and resources, textbooks, digital devices, access to reliable internet services, school transportation, and upgrading of school infrastructure. My friends, in the final analysis, it is abundantly clear that we cannot separate transformative education from the SDGs. They are directly linked one to the other. The policies, actions, and decisions of ministries of education and as minister from Finland said, it's not just education, the ministries, the national leaders, the ministries of foreign affairs, all have to be on board and their policies and actions and decisions must reflect this understanding that SDGs and transformative education uh, cannot be separated. So let us act now, thank you. We need at least a day of a panel with each one of you. There's so much richness and uh, 
we just can't get enough of you. Um, I would love to to ask the the one and only Jeffrey Sachs to to please come and and share uh, remarks uh, before we continue uh, with the with the minister ministers. Um, speaking about going beyond, beyond silos, we have Jeffrey Sachs. What an incredible uh, set of remarks, Minister, and to uh, State Secretary also. I, I only caught the last two uh, remarks, but I heard uh, our uh, wonderful ministers from Ghana and Greece yesterday. And uh, I hope we have a chance, uh, Minister of Malawi, uh, one of my favorite countries, to have a chance to uh, to speak together. But like everything in this week, I'm just running frazzled and uh, am expected at the UN. I think five minutes ago. So uh, I'm 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 going to be very very quick and brief. Let me say first of all that this transforming education summit is the best thing that's happened at the UN certainly since the adoption of the Sustainable Development Goals. This is so important, wonderful, inspiring. Stefania, thank you so much. Uh, this is your leadership and it is uh, UNESCO's leadership and it is the Secretary General and Deputy Secretary General's insight that we need to move education, not only up the agenda, but to the top of the agenda. And every word that was said here technically is exactly right, which is that without education, forget everything else, forget economic development, forget peace, forget sustainability, period. And there's not a chance for any country that doesn't educate all its kids. It's impossible. That's not true 50 years ago or 100 years ago. There were other jobs. You could kill the soils, and most people were in subsistence work, and education was a luxury. This is, those are the days of the past. And there's no future if kids are not in school and learning, and if adults aren't continuing to learn. We're going to have a session on social and emotional learning, and I think even more than children being in social and emotional learning, I would like the world leaders to have some social and emotional learning. <laughs> because they're sometimes worse than children in a sandbox, honestly. They're provoking each other. They're, I'm bigger than you. We'll defeat you. And these are countries with nuclear warheads. It's insane. So a little social, emotional learning and even happiness would help among the world leadership. But one of the things that needs to come out of this summit is actually the means to support these wonderful ministers. And uh, Stefania and I talk a lot about this. We need financing. And if I could ask our wonderful State Secretary, to speak with your absolutely wonderful commissioner in the European Commission, uh, Commissioner Erpelainen, who is herself a teacher and a wonderful person. We need the European Union to put in its cooperation agenda, education finance at the very top. We should have a partnership between the European Union and the African Union where Europe says we will be with you to make sure every child is properly educated, at least all the way through upper secondary. It's the minimum that Europe should do for itself, by the way, much less for your neighbor with 1.4 billion people and growing rapidly, and where 40% of the continent is school age, and the kids are not in school. And the sign that greets us at the UN, it shook me. I told you it shook me yesterday morning. The new study of UNESCO and UNICEF and the World Bank that only one in three 10-year-olds 
can read a paragraph and understand it. Are we gonna leave, talk about sustainability. Sustainability means that the children can pick up on their lives. And if they can't read, they can't. And if they can't do arithmetic, they can't. And if they can't continue on to vocational education or higher education, they can't. So I'm really every moment at your disposal, we're gonna get the financing because I want the ministers to say, this is what we need. We need this many schools. We need qualified teachers. We need this training. We need uh, this wonderful program of Leslie everywhere. We need practical funding so we can do the job because right now the kids aren't learning and the kids aren't even in school. And when the government of Ghana said, okay, universal, phenomenal initiative, suddenly the schools are inundated and you have to make two sessions and there aren't enough teachers and there isn't a budget and Ghana's budget is uh, like this. And so I'm trying to help the finance minister with Ghana's budget. And we need to help the IMF to understand we need enough money for this gentleman to do his job so that all the kids can be in school. It's arithmetic. So that's another thing I'd like our leaders to go back to school and do some arithmetic, some SDG arithmetic, so that there's some financing that goes along with what we are doing. Because that's all I do for a living is arithmetic. I know that the governments, the low-income countries like Malawi can't afford they just can't afford it, even if they spend the entire budget, all the budget, the national budget on education, it would not be enough to ensure that all the kids are in school. It's arithmetic. And you know, the IMF and the World Bank and what we call the civilized world sign programs that absolutely leave half the kids out. And that's viewed as normal. And by the way, leave people without health care and many other things that were declared to be human rights 75 years ago with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, because we don't do arithmetic. I suspect, I'm not sure, but I think they know how to do arithmetic in the US Treasury. I'm not sure, but I think so. <laughs> but they don't want to, because if they wanted, if they if they look, did the arithmetic, they'd say, oh. The U.S. is awfully rich, but it should give a little bit for some others. They don't want that. They really don't want that, by the way. I'm sorry to tell you. There isn't goodwill right now. But there is social justice. There is a world demanding social justice. There are global goals that have been set. There are responsibilities of all countries. And no nonsense. If we're going to save the world, we have to start here. So that's what's going to come out of this summit, I'm sure. The inspiration of the leaders in this, but then the crying need to do things differently. And Finland has an incredible education system, and it's been at the top of the world. It, so you have so much to show and help also, but we need the financing to be able to get this done. So that I think is, is the, uh, the first step. We're in a world where we all need to learn nonstop and we need to have the means to do that. And we need to have then the content of what we need to learn. And that is specifically why we're here today, which is that we need to learn to be decent people. By the way, that's not a crazy point. Aristotle made that point in 2000, uh, in, in uh, 330 BC. He made the point that learning in the polis, in the political community, was central for creating the civic virtues that would enable the political community to function. It doesn't just come out of nowhere. 
it has to be cultivated. Virtue in Greek is arete, which means excellence. It's something to cultivate. And so we have to build even our capacity to be good people. That's the lesson of the Nicomachean ethics. That's the whole point of ethics. It's not just there. It's not just a list of rules. It's cultivating our capacity to be decent people. And that's why mission 4.7 is so important. Partly it's technical. What are greenhouse gases? How does anthropogenic warming work? Uh, why do we care? Okay, fine, technical. But part of it is being citizens, is respect for culture, is a culture of peace. We don't have a culture of peace in the United States. We have shootings on my block almost every week now. We've got 300 million handguns. And the United States has involved, been involved in more than 100 military interventions since 1990. We don't have a culture of peace. We believe in war. We need a new education system. We don't like the Chinese. You know that? But I bet that a vast majority of Americans could not name two cities in China. They don't know anything about the Chinese. They know they're the enemy. That's all they know. They read it somewhere. They heard it somewhere. We need an education system that teaches something about civilization, about great civilizations like China, about why we can cooperate and need to cooperate, about what Confucian virtue ethics relates to Aristotelian virtue ethics, and that these sages had similar ideas more than 2,000 years ago, and we can use them to build the world that we really need to build together rather than provocation. I want Speaker Pelosi to take a class in this. She didn't have to fly into Taiwan just to provoke because we don't need provocation. There are too many nuclear weapons. It's so dangerous. It's so mind bogglingly wrongly directed. So that's what mission 4.7 is about. And I'm going to get out of the way because it's going to become a lot happier as soon as I stop talking. <laughs> because the next session is about happiness. And I didn't convey a lot of happiness uh, in this. I conveyed a lot of frustration and uh, a lot of feeling that we need a, a different course. But it was already recognized 10 years ago by the UN member states that happiness is not some glib, silly idea. It is a fundamental part of what we aspire to. And again, Aristotle had a good word for it, eudaimonia or eudaimonia which meant a life of thrive, which means a life of thriving. And his answer, by the way, how do you achieve a good life? How do you achieve eudaimonia? Is you cultivate virtues. He didn't say you beat up the other one, you conquer their territory, you uh, steal whenever you can get away with it. He said real happiness, real thriving, comes from cultivating those excellences of citizenship, of friendship, of personal forbearance and restraint and cultivation of moderation. And so he linked well-being, happiness in, in Latin, beatudo, which Jesus talked about on the Sermon of the Mount, and Aristotle talked about and Confucius talked about as being in proper behavior with Ren as a good, good person in your mutual relations. So that's what we're after. We're going to hear from a number of experts on social and emotional learning. Our students and teachers are frazzled after the past three years. Everybody is on edge. I see it in my granddaughter's classes and in, in upheaval of the education system right here in New York City. Everybody is on edge after all this experience. So we really need to pull together. And 
the SDGs are the wonderful way to do it. And target 4.7 is a special gift for us because it took the time to step back and say, it's not only kids in school and not only early childhood development and all those crucial things, but it's what's happening in the class to help make us better people, to help us to have tolerance, respect, a culture of peace, a sense of global citizenship, a knowledge of the world that we are in today. So that's the next panel, but let me thank all of these wonderful ministers and state secretary for gracing us with your presence and for these wonderful remarks and to everybody participating in this gathering. And special thanks really to Stefania Giannini. You all know her, but she is the mastermind behind this summit. And, and, and we're really going to we're really going to work together to make sure that the legacy of these remarkable days continues. Thank you. Well, certainly, Professor Jeffrey Sachs is not worried about sugarcoating things, and that's why we love him so much. And But he's also determined, absolutely determined, that to make this summit the game changer, and we need to team up. So thank you so much, Professor Sachs. And we will continue to, to, to enjoy and learn from the wisdom of our ministers uh, present. Uh, please, if at all possible, um, uh, let's, let's share our, our remarks uh, in five minutes. And thank you so much. I would love to invite Her Excellency Nikki Kerameus, Minister of Education and Religious Affairs from Greece. Thank you so much, Your Excellencies, fellow ministers, ladies and gentlemen. It's a true honor and pleasure to be here in this room. And I want to start off by saying that I think none of us would be here today had it not been for three people. His Excellency, Honorable Ban Ki-moon, Stefania Giannini, Professor Jeffrey Sachs. I think we owe it to the three of them that we're actually here. We're talking about transformative education. Thank you, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your commitment to making this a better place. Thank you for your dedication to transforming education. Why are we talking about transforming education? I think we're talking about transforming education because we live in a world that's changing at a very, very rapid pace, extremely rapid. Think of the students who are now entering school so they're six years old. They're gonna be called upon to enter the workforce in 2038 or 2040. In 2040, the world is gonna be very, very different. And it's really hard to predict today in 2022, what the world is gonna be like in 2040. So for us in government, it's really tough to equip the youngsters with the knowledge required. That's why we have to focus on something different. That's why we have to focus on skills. That's why the effort has to be to move from a knowledge-centric system to a skills-based system. And I wanna share some thoughts on what we're doing in Greece in that direction. With three different points. Point number one on schools, point number two on vocation education and training, and point number three on universities. First of all, in schools. In schools in Greece, we have revamped over 160 school curricula. We've changed everything. And the new approach is skills, cultivation of skills. And when I say skills, I mean critical thinking. I mean empathy. I mean problem solving. I mean collaborative work. So every single curriculum in Greece and Greek schools is focused on the cultivation of skills. And we have introduced, Stefania mentioned earlier, the need for schools to introduce climate change. In Greece, we have introduced a new subject matter. Just like we teach math and history and gym and physics, we teach what we call the skills labs. What are the skills labs? It's a new subject matter introduced into the mandatory program of school. I wanna emphasize the point. It's in the actual mandatory program. It starts at the age of four up until the age of 15. And it has four thematic axes. Number one, well-being. 
healthy lifestyle, sex education, and other, and other thematics. Number two, environment, climate change, protection and prevention of natural disasters. Number three, rights, respect for others, respect for diversity. Number four, action, STEM, STEAM, robotics, entrepreneurship, career guidance. These are thematics which are introduced into the mandatory school program. But this, because just as important as it is to be good in math, as Professor Sachs emphasized um, a while ago, it's equally important, if not more important, to know how to respect the person next to you, to know how to not park uh, in front of a ramp for people with disabilities. It's equally important. And that's something that has to start from a very early age. So the skills labs are introduced in every single school of Greece, pre-K, elementary school, junior high school. And we're teaching English as of the age of four in every single public preschool of Greece. Now, this whole change comes with a change of mentality. And I want to share um, an experience I had a few months ago. I, I try to visit as many schools as possible in Greece. I visited perhaps over 400 in the three years that, I'm, um, that I have the honor of serving as a minister. So recently, I was in a public school um, in some remote place of Greece, outside of Athens. So I walk in the classroom. We're talking about a classroom with 17-year-olds. I walk in, I go straight to the kids, but I understand something's going on. They're watching something else. Something's going on. So they're like, look, look, look you know, turn back. I was like, why? What's, what's going on? So I turn around and the classroom, this is a public classroom in Greece, is connected with the European Organization for Nuclear Research and the Greek Polytechnic School. This is a public high school in Greece. That's the future that our kids deserve. Interaction beyond borders, education beyond borders, skills. That's really the future that our kids deserve. So I talked about schools, vocational education and training. Uh, an ex extremely important segment of education. There, what Greece has done is we have changed the model. We first go and look at what the actual needs of society are. For instance, one of the professions which is in most demand in Greece nowadays is web designers. So what we do is we go first and detect and um, the actual needs of the labor market. And then we take that information into account when we decide what specialties to offer through vocation, education, and training. Because we're really concerned about bridging the gap between education and the actual needs of society. And then the third pillar, higher education, our universities. There, we have introduced a particular emphasis on apprenticeship, on practical training, on interdisciplinarity, joint degrees, double degrees, on entrepreneurship, a full-fledged regime for startup companies, for spin-off companies. Again, bridging the gap, bringing closer education to the actual needs of the labor market. Moving up to my five minutes, last three sentences. When we think about transformative education, our take is that we have to start early, we have to think big, and we have to aim high. And we all in this room have a huge responsibility, huge, to deliver to the world a younger generation that is much, much better than ours. And we will succeed. Thank you. Um, it's, it's beyond beyond what we can what we can grasp in such a short amount of time. Um, I, I would like to to invite um, our our ex Her Excellency Agnes Nyalonje, Minister of Education from Malawi. Um, and then I will follow up with one question, but it's just a word. Good afternoon, all the way from uh, Malawi, the warm heart of Africa, as we like to call it. 
Uh, the, the challenge with uh, speaking last is that uh, the constrictions of time apply more severely, as, uh, as I'm sure you will see. So um, in Malawi last year, we adopted our long-term development plan, the Malawi 2063. Uh, Malawi 2063 is about Malawi's aspirations that by the time we get to 2063, we will be an inclusively wealthy, self-reliant, upper middle income country, fully industrialized. Uh, one or two things about Malawi. Uh, just as you heard from Prof. Jeffrey Sachs, uh, Africa is very young. And within Africa, there are certain countries that have the fastest growing population. Malawi is one of them. In the Southern African region, it's an outlier in that sense. We grow at 3% per year. Currently, we are at uh, about almost 20 million people. Now, um, that um, uh, Malawi 2063 draws from our constitution, which has a whole section on the duties of the duty bearers, the government, what citizens of Malawi should expect from their government. And when you look at it, it is in effect like the SDGs. And as Minister of Education, my uh, mandate starts from there. Uh, it is very clear what I ought to do as minister, and that is amplified in the Act, Education Act, which clearly says, for example, that I have no business uh, presiding over a sector that's uh, 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 divisive or that uh, leaves uh, children with disabilities behind. Uh, the marching orders are make sure you provide education services that have equity at the heart of it and that uh, 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 you are inclusive, even as you're, you're uh, uh, searching for, to uh, achieve the core business of education. These are the principles that we start with. So that chapter in, the, in our constitution that I talked about, if I was to speak in our uh, uh, Bantu uh, uh, lingua, it's a, they are about Umuntu. You have to reflect that, that's number one. So starting from there, our Malawi 2063 has uh, the agenda 2063 of the African Union as a backdrop and the SDGs as a backdrop. So when we uh, then have developed our national education sector investment plan, which now with the Malawi 2063, because our investment plan as a sector was developed before the country got together and put together the long-term development plan. Uh, that has now been incorporated into our first 10-year plan on the road to 2063. So that everything that Malawi aspires to do in education, which boils down to the single biggest thing is that uh, every Malawian child should have a minimum of 12 years schooling, which is uh, basic all the way to secondary. Um, so everything that we're doing incorporates already the SDGs. So I'm not going to talk about um, take them apart and so on, because as Minister of Education, the plans we have already have that written into them. Now, let me give you statistics. I said that by 2063, we want to be an inclusively wealthy upper middle income country that leaves no one behind. Uh, right now, as I speak, Malawi has a 90% or 89% net enrollment for secondary for primary school. Out of that, only 52% complete their primary school. Secondary school, only 15% of all the youth. Oh, let, did I say that Malawi's population is three quarters or a little more than three quarters youth? Out of that, the biggest component is zero to 15. Mm -hmm. So as I'm telling you about the stats, remember that one. Um, so 15% only that ought to be in secondary school are in secondary school. And uh, university and uh, technical education is less than 1%. But 2063, look out, here we come, Malawi, we are, yeah. So how, how is it going to happen? How is it going to happen? I think you asked at the beginning that what is it that uh, uh, you like about your job? What's the best thing? I think the best thing for me being Minister of Education is that I'm leading a team that believes in themselves. We know we are at the bottom of many things, but we know we have faith in our ability to get there because here's why. Uh, when it comes to the core business of education, uh, we can deliver. 
And uh, we have at the moment with the, uh, uh, again, let me uh, look at what Jeffrey Sachs said. Uh, he talked about uh, the 30%, only 30% of uh, children in low and uh, middle income countries globally can read with comprehension a simple text. In Sub-Saharan Africa, that drops to 10% and Malawi is among that. But uh, we don't lose hope because we know that Malawi used to have an education system that was going places. A system where when I first started school, a uh, long time ago, uh, had that. Uh, and uh, uh, we know we can go back to that, but there are challenges. So we have um, a dream and we have the stats I've given you. How do we get there? Especially when only 10% of our children seem to learn anything from what we have at the moment. The task is big, but we think we have the answer. And the answer that we've decided upon for, when we're talking for, about transformation, let me also say this, transformation is relative and it's very context specific. When I, as Minister of Education, uh, with only half the classrooms I need for primary school education right now as we speak, and less than half the, the secondary schools I need for secondary education, when you expand the infrastructure, that is transformation. The difference between being a minister of education in Malawi and they say minister of education in Switzerland where my children went to school is that uh, in Malawi, parents say, where is the school? When you tell us, keep the girls in school, in Malawi, they say, where is the school to keep my girls in? Whereas in Switzerland, when we went, we, we thought, which school shall we put our children in? That's the difference. What is transformation? It depends on where you're starting from. So in, in Malawi, uh, if we are going to lift uh, secondary education from only being able to provide education for 15 of every 100 of our children, that is transformation. So what are we looking for? We're looking for big time resources at all levels. But let me take a step back. We believe that uh, some of the challenges we face because the fact that we have this uh, uh, um, um, resource challenge is the biggest does not mean we do not also have the traditional basic education type challenges, which as I said, I'm not going to spend time on because I know I have a competent team. And if we have the bigger picture resource, we can do it and we will do it, but we need a bit of help. And uh, here's why. We believe that uh, our North Star for transforming Malawi's education is revisiting how we do foundational skills. With foundational skills strengthened and changed to suit today's world, we believe we'll reduce dropouts. We believe we'll reduce uh, repetitions. We believe the education system will become more efficient and more efficient because children are learning. So our core strategy for uh, uh, making sure that we start there, not that we'll ignore all other things, we'll continue those, but we will with laser sharp focus, uh, uh, fix on foundational skills. And that has five basic elements. Number one, we're going to deploy our best teachers in the law grade classes of primary. <laughs> primary is one to four. Number two, we are going to look at improving the quality of teacher training and support to our teachers. Teachers need to be appreciated. Speaking as a daughter of uh, a head teacher at primary school who is long dead, but uh, he spent all his life as a teacher. And so I know a thing or two about the life of the teacher mm -hmm. in rural areas with 11 children and educating near all of them until one of them is standing here today to speak to you. So I know that teachers need to be appreciated and need to be given the resources. So we intend to make that a core part of the search for foundational skills. Number three, uh, we want uh, to make sure that uh, we review our curriculum so that it's not only relevant to the Malawi 2063, but it's relevant to the ever-changing aspirations of young people. As we speak uh, right now, as I'm here, 
Malawians are wanting us to bring back civics, which used to be a subject when I went to school. Malawians are wanting to introduce peace studies in our curriculum. Malawians are wanting to, us to introduce uh, 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 anti-corruption measures in the curriculum. Integrity is very important to Malawians. I did say that Umuntu is what captures it all. It, in, in short, Malawians want an education that is uh, anchored around the principles of Umuntu. For those who don't know, sometimes we say Ubuntu, but uh, we're the part of Africa where we come from, we say Ubuntu. Um, number four, uh, we are going to, uh, so curriculum review and uh, 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 resourcing. I want to take a moment on that because we have a curriculum that's reasonably strong, but when you do not have the resources to fully resource the curriculum, it looks as though you don't have it. You may have the best science curriculum, but if you don't have resources to have laboratories, science teachers, textbooks, it looks like you're not teaching science. And that's what we've been doing. We've not been teaching science because we've not had the way we do to do it effectively. Uh, then we also want to look at school feeding because we know that malnutrition and other health issues amongst our children prevent them from really learning when they come to school. And uh, number five and final is that we know that because of the challenges of access, limited space for learning, we know that it will take years and years before we find enough money to build enough classrooms and house every child in a classroom. So we are putting together, we have put together uh, what we call a national blended face-to-face -face and digitalized uh, learning program. And that has uh, the partnership of uh, FCDO, the Foreign and Commonwealth uh, Development Office in the UK, uh, the Royal Norwegian uh, Government, VSO, for those who, of you who know what that is, One Billion, uh, JBJ Foundation, and Imagine Worldwide, our partners. And we've developed this program, which uh, is built around these five elements. And because these elements already have evidence that each one of them, if you do things in a certain way, it works. We've built it on what works, what is known to work, uh, an evidence base. So we know that if we really push ourselves, we can do it. And 2063 is possible and it will happen. But having said all that, Malawi achieves 20% or more sometimes, or less sometimes like now with COVID, of its national resource envelope towards education. Even when we don't achieve that, education has consistently been the top in our allocation of resources. It's always number one, always. What, is, what, what that is saying is that Malawians believe and know in their hearts of heart, heart of hearts that education is the route to uh, uh, 2063 that we, we aspire to get. So when all is said and done, it is frustrating as a Minister of Education to go to meetings such as this and always parade our challenges in the hope that somebody will release some resources that can get up. If, if, if Malawi's education system was a manual transmission engine, car or whatever, I would have said, we always ever get just enough help to get into neutral, but never beyond. Is it because we don't have the capacity? No, we don't have the capacity. We do have the capacity to do what, and we know what we must do, but there's never enough. And if we get a lot of resources, usually it's chosen, like say, you get resources to do with teachers, but being a minister of education, I was saying the other day jokingly, but also seriously, it's like being a master baker <laughs> of a cake. Uh, maybe you could say bread, but I prefer cake. There is a certain number of ingredients that must be put together and put together in certain proportions and in a certain sequence to get what you need. So when you remove any one of them or you remove some of what you need, you get what you get. And we've been getting what we get and 10% of uh, uh, 10 year olds being able to read is part of what we've got because what we've been able to do. So I'm saying all these, I'll leave it on. All I'm saying is when we talk about transforming education in low income countries, middle income countries, it's all about resources. By the way, uh, my colleague, uh, uh, minister from Finland, I spend a lot of time watching and watching again and again the video uh, from the um, uh, fin Finnish uh, education minister 
sometimes I almost cry. The last time I watched was three weeks ago as I was preparing to do a, 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 a skit for uh, on anti-corruption um, uh, because it is a beautiful thing to watch. It is, it represents uh, pushing the boundaries of possibility, but while you said it's not, uh, I think you said uh, it's, it's, it's about policy and hard work, definitely, but it's also about resources, because when you've exhausted all the resources you have and your population is growing so fast and you're, you're, you're already way at the bottom in terms of delivering education, what else can you do? Would you do it with pebbles from the beach? No, nobody has ever built a system, an education system that's worth its name without resources. Three weeks ago, I had uh, four members of parliament from uh, the Austrian, uh, uh, from Austria, uh, came to see me in my office. When they mentioned the annual budget, the Austrian annual budget for education, I nearly fell off my seat. 60 billion euros. Isn't that wonderful? And I know it is possible to get education because I was fortunate enough to work in international organizations, including the UN. So my children got that education. As minister of education, I just want the same for my social children in Malawi. And we need, so here is what I'm saying. Countries such as Malawi, we cannot do it and get to that point where we change gear to the sixth gear without the massive resources. So this summit, if it's going to make any difference, it's got to look at the IMF and what they do. Here's what uh, is at the heart of it. No transformation is possible without teachers. When IMF sets constrictions on wage bills for poor countries like Malawi, and you can't recruit the teachers you need, we only have half the teachers we need in secondary school as we speak, as I stand here. If the, the wage bill increases, because uh, teachers are the biggest component of any civil service. And so we cannot recruit beyond a certain point because we'll overshoot our limit. And so how do you achieve SDG4, Madam uh, Janini? SDG4 without teachers? SDG4 without teachers. And why not remove that constriction? So transformation for anybody who cares means IMF needs to come to the table. Because why are they not engaging with us? Why are they not engaging with us? To look at why some of the system that's in place today is designed to fail us. And that's the long and short of it, I'm afraid. And that's why some of us are very frustrated, passionate, but very frustrated. And sometimes we look very angry because we are angry. There's, no, there's nothing to smile about because it, we are capable but we need our hands untied. We need the blindfolds taken off because we know where to go. 2063 in Malawi is very possible, but the global community must do its part. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it, so powerful. Master Baker or superheroes right here. Um, thank you so much. Uh, definitely resources are absolutely key. There's no transformation without teachers, that's for sure. We will base on the foundational skills. Um, yes, also transformation is definitely rel relative to context and uh, to context specific. So we need to understand that. Um, thank you so much to all of you for, for being here. We really want more of you, um, but unfortunately we have to, to go to to the next part, well, fortunately also, because it's going to be extraordinary. Uh, Radhika, would you please share with us? Thank you so much. Thank you also to Dina for moderating this uh, excellent panel. Thank you for uh, doing your hard work and making this come together. Um, we will start with our next panel on taking this deeper because without ESD and without happiness and without SEL, I think this whole panel will be incomplete. So let's move on to our next panel on happiness and uh, social emotional learning um, by the Happiness Council. There is also lunch served. So we will at the end of the panel uh, discussion for panel two, we will also have lunch. Uh, so please stay on and let's move over to the happiness uh, panel. My name is Alison Bellwood. I am the creator of a program called The World's Largest Lesson. 
Um, and I am absolutely delighted to be here at Columbia um, and to have witnessed all of the uh, sharing from the ministers, to hear from Sister Stefania, um, from Jeff as well, um, because for the last seven years, I have been waving the flag for the SDGs in the classroom, working on the ground with teachers and with kids, getting this little badge into their hearts and minds. And so it's so exciting to have heard from those ministers that we are finally cutting through. And we've done that really from the ground up. And finally, the top has recognized what's happening. So what we're gonna be doing today is actually shifting the, the conversation a little bit. We're gonna be focusing on what happens on the ground and real experiences of real teachers who are working hard every single day to lead the education system. We're gonna be focusing on social and emotional learning because over the last seven years, all of the work we've been doing with children, understanding the goals and how they feel about them and how they want to respond to them shows us that we can teach kids how we can teach kids to kind of access the knowledge of sustainability and climate change and they can get that knowledge but we will never move towards full sustainable development unless kids are really ready to take the actions that are needed and we can only do that with social and emotional learning so we've got a really exciting panel um, and I'm going to introduce you to them one by one. We have Dr. Lara Atkin, who is the editor of the World Happiness Report. Um, she is a professor and lab director at the Helping and Happiness Lab at Simon Fraser University. So she is your expert on happiness. We have Lisa Vortman, who is the marketing director for Good Humor. Um, who is a new partner to me at Project Everyone, helping us to bring social and emotional learning and happiness to the classroom. Um, we have Luca Parry, founder and CEO of The Learning Future and founding member of Karanga, which is a global uh, collaboration of organizations teaching social and emotional learning. We have Rachel McDonald, an educator and education consultant from Jamaica. So we are spread across the world here. And there is an empty seat. And I would like to invite Rory Hollihan, who is um, here uh, in the audience. He's joined us and we decided to invite him to the panel. He's an LGBTQI rights activist with UNICEF. He is 17 years old. He told me earlier he has never done a panel in person. He's only ever done them online. But he, of all of us in the room, has more lived experience of education right now than any of us. And so he is very welcome to join the panel and we would love him to share. Please join the panel. So, so what we're going to do is I'm, 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 gonna, I'm not going to kind of do the traditional ask a question and then everyone responds in turn. Um, we want to build this conversation up um, and we want everybody to feel able to contribute um, if, if they want to. We're going to explore social and emotional learning. We're going to explore what it is in practice. We're going to consider the role and available evidence that happiness and well-being plays in supporting learners to develop the skills and the values that we need for them to drive sustainable development. And really importantly, we cannot forget that many children across the world have been out of school for two years or more. So we, we need to link this conversation back to COVID recovery and what that needs to be like um, from now on in. So let's get started. I think I'm going to go first to Luca um, and just can you help us define social and emotional learning, talk about how it connects to happiness and well-being? Thank you, Alison. Hello, colleagues. It's great to be with you all. Uh, I'm, yeah, I feel very privileged to be here, in fact. Um, I don't think that a case needs to be made. I think we've had Jeffrey, we've had the ministers all speak to this really powerfully. But what specifically are we talking about? Well, so the social and emotional learning also is known by many names, too many names, non-cognitive skills, you know, um, sometimes soft skills in the business sector, but really they are the fabric of learning itself. And so this idea when we, how do we understand ourselves, self-awareness, how do we regulate our emotional state? How do we interact? You know, have you know social awareness and relationship skills and then ultimately how do we become good citizens ethical decision making you know and so the way that we feel 
how connected we are. And ultimately, of course, the cognition is all part of this piece. And the one thing I would say, even though we're talking about social and emotional learning, there are all these false dichotomies that exist. So of course, how we feel influences how we think. And as an educator myself, you see this really clearly when, when young people in particular are dysregulated emotionally, it's pretty difficult to enter any kind of optimal flow state of learning. And so we've sp I think we've heard about access gaps so far from you know, our political leaders. And of course, there's an, so you have this access challenge, but also you have this engagement challenge. Even in countries like Australia, you know, we have an engagement problem, a significant engagement problem. And so this idea of allowing people to attend to who they are, how they feel, and how they interact with each other, particularly in this, as you said, Alison, post-pandemic, you know, where we've been told to socially distance when, of course, it always should have been physical distancing with deep social connectedness. And so I'll finish with the questions change when we start to talk about social emotional learning and elevating it into our learning systems. We start to say things not about what do you think or what question or show me your learning. We say things like, how are you feeling right now? Or how socially connected are you? Who show, how, how are you going with your friendships at this point? And so those questions become more and more integral into the learning process. And we also see long-term impact. And we also see an increase in academic results as well. And when you put it like that, you can, you can see what Jeff meant when he said, perhaps some of our political leaders might need to have a bit of this learning because it's, it is so holistic, so complete. I'm actually going to go to Rory now and just ask Rory to respond to, to how Luca has defined social and emotional learning and kind of ask you, are you, do you feel you're receiving that kind of education and, and, and how, how would you like to um, respond to the way he has set that up? So, um... I personally feel that in schools, it is so important post-pandemic to receive. It, it, there's a big argument at the moment. Do we talk, do we catch up on these skills that were missed out on as a result of school closures over the last two to three years? Or do we allow children to be children? Because you have one chance in your lifetime to be a child. And you can always return to school or to a nighttime class to catch up on that biology lesson that you never learned. But you can never go to an evening class to learn about or experience the richness and the pure individuality and just exciting experiences that comes with being a child. And I think that we have to remember that we are children first. We are children who cannot take on so much pressure, who need to be free to explore life and learn about themselves and the people around them and the world around them. And ensuring that we are emotionally well will better ensure further learning down the road. Thank you. I think that it's, it's just so important to hear from you. Um, you know, we can all assume so much. I'm a parent, I assume a lot about what my children are thinking and feeling, but we have to, we have to ask and we have to listen really carefully to young people um, in order to be able to make this work. So thank you, um, Rory. Lara, can you help us, can you help kind of connect us back um, to the previous panel in terms of like, how, how, do, how does this root, really root itself in mission 4.7 back to esd you know that we're kind of going to see cycles i think with this certainly yeah i um sel development is really trying to build up a competent complete person i think it's pushing us to think beyond the curriculum and i think there were some really amazing words said about how um, our education should not system should not just teach the skills and competencies we want in a curriculum but the curriculum should be bigger that it should model the um, how we want people to interact with one another and how we want them to view themselves and what we can envision for a better society. And um, I can go into the research if you like about how kind of building these capacities really opens up our mind. When we're terrified, when we're angry, we see a very narrow world. Uh, but when people feel 
calm and comfortable and connected and happy, um, then we can kind of understand uh, more information, but build better relationships with the world around us. And there is abundant information from the World Happiness Report and elsewhere showing that when people are happier, they build better relationships, they earn more money, not that that is the ultimate goal, but it, that, that, that comes out in the literature as well, um, that they're more concerned and involved in the environment, that they're more engaged citizens uh, in their local and larger context. And so I think it really ties back these ideas together. The SEL is kind of um, the foundational skills we want students to have, people to have when they're engaging in 4.7 and, and their communities at large. Yeah, I, I, and, and I think that if, if we consider, we consider now and we also consider the future, all of the things you've described help us to imagine a world where if children are receiving this from age three upwards, then the conditions will be set for all of the creative thinking, all of the problem solving that we're going to need of them. They can't be creative if they're not comfortable. They can't think beyond where we are now if they're not comfortable and happy. So thank you um, for that. I would love to find out a little bit more about the role that SEL is literally playing in the classrooms right now. Um, and Rachel um, works on the ground in Jamaica um, in some very challenging uh, situations. And I'd love Rachel to share a bit more about the work that she's doing. Thank you, Alison. Hello, everyone. Greetings from Jamaica. Um, there's a very young artist in Jamaica. Her name is Coffee, and she sings a song, and the lyrics are all about gratitude. She says, gratitude is a must. And we know once we start with gratitude, we automatically start to feel better. So let me just say thank you for allowing me to be here today and to share my personal experiences of what is taking place in a country, small island developing state like mine. So I think I'm very lucky in the sense that I get to work in edu spaces and I don't say classrooms or school halls or anything, but spaces, um, underserved communities, schools, infant departments, high schools, you name it, I'm there. And I think what I've realized in the last few years is that in countries like mine, children were grown up or we were grown up with the notion that we should be seen and not heard. Well, I'm not a child, but children should be seen and not heard. And I think this has literally filtered through our educational landscape. And what has happened is that our youth, our children, have not had a voice in anything that concerns them. And that has been absolutely detrimental. So pre the pandemic, what we started to do was have fun. So I built a company around fun. It was called Fundaciones. Um, it was a bilingual program, but fun remained at the center of everything we did. And people looked at me and were like, what, what, what are you doing? You want children to come to school and have fun? It's like, absolutely. Well, why? Well, we're going to remember what they're doing. They're going to get lost in it. They're going to just forget about all the trials and tribulations that they face. And that was not necessarily as appreciated pre-pandemic as it was post-pandemic. And, um, you know, we would do things like mindfulness, something that I call the whiffle, which is what I feel like expressing. And people just didn't understand it. Then 2020 happens and then everyone starts to go like, oh my gosh, we can't connect. And, you know, thankfully our policymakers are starting to understand the very detrimental and archaic effects of what has happened. So I wanna share with you the story of a little boy that I've worked with called Ajani, if you allow me to. So Ajani lives in a very underserved community in Kingston, Jamaica. And Ajani was one of those students who was not able to engage in academic studies. He's about nine, eight, nine years old now, um, once the pandemic hit. So they had no devices to connect with. They had no internet. If they had internet, they had no devices and vice versa. They could not engage. And what happened is we were fortunate enough to create an after school and out of school program. We defied the odds. We went in there despite people saying no public gathering. Hope I don't get in much trouble for that. <laughs> but we did what we had to do and we engaged those children. And, you know, one of the things that we prioritized in those programs was the whiffle and mindfulness. And every teacher looked at me and said, that's not what we need to focus on. We need to focus on the literacy and the numeracy. And I said, no. Please also remember, we have to focus on it. And one day there was massive shootings and the teachers could not get into the community. 
thankfully I was a lot closer and I was able to get into the community and start the kids off. So there I am, I pull up to the center and I literally see one of my kids waving to me aggressively. So I'm literally taking out my phone to record just how excited he was to see me. When I see a man beside him, literally his hand is in his head, he is distraught. So I put away the phone naturally and I said, oops, I guess the shootings today are a lot more serious than we thought because someone must have passed. So we go inside, we get started and we get started with the whiffle. And the first thing that comes out of Ajani's mouth is this. What I feel like expressing today is that I want to avenge my dad's murder. So the whiffle is a safe space. There's no comment. There is nothing to say. You just literally say, thank you for sharing. We move on to the next student, Keisha. And Keisha starts telling us about what happened now when Ajani's dad was shot. And, and, and I mean, she gets into the graphic and gory details. And literally after working with these children for weeks and months, I had no idea that this was their reality. They come and they smile and everything looks nice and dandy. And it wasn't until we were able to have an opportunity for them to express and say wholeheartedly what was on their mind that we were able to say, all right, stop. We, we can't push math today. We can't work on, work on our vocabulary today because there is something else that is much bigger that's being triggered by what's happening to these students and thankfully you know we're able to call in psychologists but if we don't address those issues that vicious cycle of criminality of violence continues and those same children are preyed upon and we can't advance right so I mean thankfully for strategies like whiffle for strategies like mindfulness for strategies like we were talking earlier Luca you know, emotional check-ins, we are able to offer that support to children. And we're also able to realize a lot of things that we didn't as teachers. So that gives you a little bit of perspective, I hope not too much, um, about what is taking place on the ground and, and how SEL is really transforming that. Thank you. And of course, the, the, you know, that's a terrible situation it for children terrible. to be growing up in. It is terrible. Um, but, but it's the reality. But it's the reality. Exactly. And the reality for children in other parts of the world is their own unique Correct. story too. Correct. Um, and creating those conditions that are um, straight, kind of clean and enabling them to just share with no judgment, no questioning, it, it, it can, can expose an enormous amount um, of what's going on inside. Luca, can you do you have any more kind of strategies that you're seeing used in the classroom that you'd like to share? Yeah, um, thank you so much, Rachel, and it's inspiring work. Um, there's lots. I mean, one of the things I fundamentally believe is that the principles are few, but the methods are many. And I think yeah. we've just heard from Rachel that context is queen. You know, young. Mm -hmm. There are things that are universal, like agency, the ability to feel in control of your own emotions, your own life, your own learning. That I think is. That's a universal principle, but the methods, of course, will be different. And so uh, what I see a lot in our work at Karanga and elsewhere is, is it, that we can talk as much as we like about these ideas, but it's until we embody, until we experience them. And I think that, again, Jeffrey made the very clear point that actually it starts with adults. And so we've got a great program for students and they have this wonderful experience and then they go into a classroom where the teacher is not yet expressing, you know, using these practices. So I'm a big fan of lots of different practices and many different programs. Some of the kernels I think are really possible because a teacher is nothing, you know, is, is many things, but certainly they are a practitioner. It's about the doing because the young people will be waiting for you on Monday morning, regardless if you're prepared or not. Okay. And so certainly emotional check-ins, really powerful using great principles like Wiffle, creating a safe space, uh, the mood meter, I think some of the work out of Yale is really good by Professor Mark Brackett and other colleagues, but also uh, and even things like coming back to breath and mindfulness. Yes. So one thing, in fact, I'm going to do this. Can I take 30 seconds? Yes. Right. I feel like it's the right moment to do this. Mm -hmm. Is uh, I'm just going to share a practice that I've seen many great educators use. Uh, and it's just a mindfulness breathing activity. We'll take 30 seconds only. It's called box breathing. Some of you may have done this before. And the provocation I always use is uh, who taught you to breathe? It's a really interesting question because not many of us have had this embodied experience. So if you've crossed your legs, that's wonderful. It's comfortable. Please uncross them. We're symmetrical beings. Isn't that remarkable? Yes. Find yourself comfortable in your chair, supported, you know, on that seat. And if you're comfortable, close down your eyes. Otherwise, just soften your gaze and just listen to my voice. We're only going to breathe in and out and hold at the top and hold at the bottom. So it'll be for five seconds. So 
I'd like you to breathe in through your nose for five seconds. One, two, three, four, five. Hold your breath with your lungs full. Three, four, five. And exhale. Two, three, four, five. And hold, exhaled. Three, four, five. Again, breathing in through your nose. Feel your belly and your chest expand. Hold. And breathe out for five seconds. And hold. One more time. Breathing in. And hold. And breathing out. And feel your body just relax into the chair. And hold. Two, three, four, five. And just allow your breathing to come back to its natural rhythm. If your eyes are still closed, keep them closed. I'd like you to send a little piece of gratitude to a person that you're thankful is in your life. Your partner, a friend, someone in your family, a colleague. And when you feel ready, please open your eyes and return back to the room. Ah. Thank you for diving into that practice. But that's one example, Alison, of how powerful even 60 seconds of mindfulness can be at the beginning of a lesson. And I think because our educators feel so overwhelmed, you know, with so much content to teach, we sometimes lose the beauty. You know, this investment we can make with 60 seconds will get us more mastery, better outcomes in the end, I think. And of course, it's, it's this kind of experience in the classroom that is really difficult to describe. It's really difficult to persuade parents and leaders that it's what we need because you can't really measure it so well. Um, you know, it, it, it's just quite difficult to evidence, isn't it? Um, Lara, can you kind of help us on that a bit? Is there sort of evidence to suggest that the these kind of classroom interventions are valuable yeah i was going to push back and say there's actually it, i think it is tangible i think it's yeah. measurable it's subjective um there's also subjective assessments where we can ask students how they're feeling um measures of happiness but also measures of related constructs like stress and optimism um thriving uh meaningfulness all of these things can be self-reported but we can also objectively get at them from the outside and i think there is a lot of evidence to suggest programs of this sort and interventions of this sort through randomized controlled trials um, and clearly well-designed experiments do support the benefits um, so I, I i realize they're not always easy to implement i think sometimes there is some tension as uh, rory was saying earlier i think especially as we return from the pandemic there's this big urge to get students back up to curriculum pace thinking that this is in contrast or intention with the pursuit of deeper educational learning, um, whether it be arithmetic or otherwise. Uh, but I think it, it's in fact not parallel, it's not counterproductive. I think it, they're both propelling students in the same direction. So there's evidence to support it. And I think there's a lot of evidence to show it. It can, they, they kind of encourage each other. It's more the sum of its parts, actually. Thank you. And, and of course we do know that um, there are some incredible programs being, driven in lots of different parts of the world to try and get this moving. There's one of one of the most talked about programs is um, being run by the Delhi government to support the teaching of happiness um, there. And I can see some people in the room who I think are slightly involved in some of the evaluation frameworks for that. Um, and they, they, they are really acting as a catalyst for these programs to be then be modeled and, and developed in the right contextual way for um, other settings. I'm going to switch now to, um, to talk uh, to Lisa, um, because um, Lisa, you bring a different kind of perspective on, on this. You're a stakeholder in the education system as a mum and also as a, as, as a private sector representative, because one day you'll be hiring a lot of these kids um, that are currently in school. Um, and you're now investing a significant energy and kind of funding in the teaching of happiness to children. So could you just help us understand, so what's led you to that? What, where's the, you know, what's the journey that's led you to want to invest in it and to encourage the teaching of happiness to children? Yeah. 
it's a, it's a privilege to be sitting on the panel with you guys. I said this to you before and I'll say it here again. Um, you really drive initiatives across the board that are phenomenal. And I think it is the corporate social responsibility of companies like Unilever and many others to really fund, get behind these initiatives and partner with the people that are driving the impact. And so whether I'm speaking on behalf of the Global Walls brand that has uh, been selling ice cream for over 100 years, we really are in the business of creating special moments, right? Happiness, smiles across the board when you're sharing an ice cream with family or friends. But um, if you want to make impact, it has to be sustainable and it has to be ongoing. It has to be more than just a moment. And so uh, over the course of, and I think this goes back to 2019, when we were one of the co-partners um, mm -hmm. to create the World's Happiness Report and start to really get a seat at the table to talk about the topic at hand that is so critical and get the data that um, as a corporation and as a brand, we think is our responsibility to action. And so we've, with that, we've evolved into partnering with Project Everyone and um, start to create and launch the world, the World's Happiness Project. And so the World's Happiness Project is about developing a toolkit for educators um, to be able to bring the social emotional learning into the classroom. Um, and actually one of the box breathing tools, uh, good for adults and children, is part of the deck of cards that is all about um, you know, being more aware and more in touch with your emotions and what that's like. And so the, the happiness project is really all about giving the educators, the kids, the types of tools that they need to incorporate into their academic curriculums. And how, how, what do you hope to achieve through it? Our, our biggest objective is to continue to underline how significantly important social emotional learning is in the classrooms. There's a ton of surveys and a ton of data that goes on and on about, you know, adults believing, uh, more than 90% of adults believing how important emotional learning is. Uh, an unhappy child just can't learn math. You guys know that better than I. Um, and what's happened over the course of the last couple of years is really been detrimental to children's development, right? And it, it goes without say that um, this, this element of isolation within virtual learning, whether it is my, you know, children under the age of 10 or teenagers that are, you know, going on in their high school journeys, this notion of loneliness has really impacted and slowed children down to be able to progress in their academic desires. And so our, our intent is to give the tools to kind of drive an element of empathy. Empathy has actually been one of uh, the biggest tools. And as you said, I am without a doubt um, a stakeholder of this, but has been an instrumental tool in helping kids understand how the other is feeling. Um, we want to give children the ability to express their feelings to teachers and as a result, kind of develop this relationship that you're talking about where when they see a teacher and they, they wave and they run because they're their own sense of comfort. Um, there's an element of self-awareness, an element for children to be able to make their own problem solving, um, you know, kind of type of situations. And most of all, start to understand that um, mental health is without a doubt a positive thing, just to sort of kind of allude to that being a positive that children take forward and um, grow up to be happy citizens above all else. Thank you. Um, Rory, have you got anything to add to that? Just going back to what Lisa said, I was thinking there needs to be empathy for these students who were so strongly impacted by the pandemic and the closure of schools. And just thinking back to my education, I'm in my final year of school and it is mandatory in Ireland to study Irish. And it really reminded me of this one old saying, or as we call it, a shanokal. Mull on Oga, August Chucky She. Praise the youth and they will flourish. Mm -hmm. It is so important to empathize, understand, and give children the attention to empower them to grow and develop into great human beings. And I have just one message before we finish up. Keep us in the conversation. That's all. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you, Rory. So of course we are in really quite unusual times at the moment. And, and the 
impact of school closures on learners of all ages is only really just coming out. We're seeing it in data. We've obviously seen the shocking statistic that you'll see at the at the UNICEF installation on UN Plaza, one in three, only one in three children can read and understand a simple story at the age of 10. Um, and the urgency that we are all feeling across the world to respond to that and to act and, and improve that situation makes it uh, easy for teachers to feel the pressure that that is where they need to act. They need to spend more time on literacy, more time on numeracy. How do, how do we help, how should educators balance this pressure that they are under? You know, I'm a governor of primary school in London and the teachers there say that to me all the time. They want to invest time in other things, but the numbers yeah. that they are having to respond to are um, putting a huge amount of pressure onto them. So how, how can educators balance this pressure to uh, kind of helping learners recover um, alongside the need to build social and emotional skills? Who wants to go first? Rachel. Mm -hmm. Rachel. Um, I will, no problem. You know, as, as Rory just said, praise the youth and they will flourish. I yeah. mean, that is so profound. And it takes me back to what the UN Secretary General mentioned as he called us to action on Friday. He said, we need to remember to create a society of solidarity versus a society of competition. And to me, what that literally means is meeting the students where they are, literally, emotionally, physically, geographically, and academically. So literally hanging out outside under a tree, Jen, literally by the river, on the corner, wherever, meeting them in their fashion trends or listening to songs that mean something to them, because ultimately we want to ride on what they are doing and we want to feel good. So if they're in a space that is making them feel good, who are we to take them from that space, right? So, I mean, we have to remember that in order to drive this sort of transformation, we need to sort of juxtapose it against, you know, meeting them in their most authentic and vulnerable selves, right? And again, I want to just, with your permission, reference Ajani's story. So Ajani, like many other Jamaican children, are always smiling. If you look at any picture, if you Google it right now, Jamaican children, you're gonna see Jamaican children smiling. And pre what I discovered a year ago with Ajani, I thought all Jamaican children were happy because we're always smiling, but that is not the case, right? You know, the, what we see on the surface is not always a reflection of what really is. So we have to ask educators to be mindful of that and not be fooled by what they think is at the surface. Um, I think the next thing I would want to probably say is to encourage educators to, you know, just dig at the, just don't, don't just scratch the surface, just, just, just dig it, just go all in. And, um, Remember, too, that modeling, children learn by modeling. So if we are going to really drive change, if we're going to try and balance things, let us not just, just talk the talk, but walk the walk as well. You know? and, and Luca, I'd, I'd love you to add anything on kind of how to support teachers in doing this. You know, what kind of training can we give? How can we really move it on? I, I think, for example, um, I think, Roy, as you said it beautifully, it's this piece around agency. And so just as, you know, education is done to students, sometimes education is done to teachers. And so I, I feel like we really need to move away from this grammar of schooling as it's described towards this language of learning. And so that means sometimes slowing down, maybe even doing some healing yeah. before we start improving and getting back on it. I mean, literacy and numeracy are key literacies, but they are the floor and not the ceiling. And I think we always get stuck in these false dichotomies. It's like, are we doing academics now or are we doing well-being now? Well, this is, this is a double helix. This is completely interrelated. And so you can just start with some simple kernels of practice, 60 seconds, a little check-in, you know, just weaving this in. This is the fabric of learning. Learning is a social act, you know, and we are all so deeply connected as the pandemic has taught us, mm -hmm. you know? And so understanding the relationships between ideas, building the relationships between each other, I think that's incredibly important and I, I would say as an Australian that does lots of global work even, even in my home country there is teachers are at breaking point it's fair to say I think frazzled was the term that somebody used one of the ministers used everybody's frazzled and so before we just switch back on to this kind of pace we should pause for long enough to realize rather than let's go back to what school was 
let's have the conversation about what school can be. And then Leslie, who made the point so passionately, then we need to repurpose it. We need to remake it. We need to embody that. Mm -hmm. And so that's when the ideas become action, become reality. And so I guess, you know, to every educator, particularly if you're in this room, it's, you know, keep going. What you do matters every single day. And also, you know, it's the reflection on we're all in this together and that we, we need to couple back. We need to literally remember the learning process because we are schooling people when we should be creating learning experiences and environments that are social, emotional and cognitive in this beautifully woven way. Yes. Thank you, Laura. I just wanted to add, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Um, I, some of my colleagues and I have been studying other ways in which education can be reimagined. It was, it, I was thought about it uh, earlier today when the minister from Ghana said rethinking the transformational learning, rethinking what it can look like, and following up what Rachel said too, outside of the classroom. Um, my colleagues and I have been really interested in this program run in a, in Saskatchewan for a rural part of Canada. Um, it's th This is just one example program, but it's called the Intergenerational Classroom, and the sixth grade students spend their entire year completing their full curriculum in an elder care facility. And it's incredible watching these relationships build over the course of a year, and they've had to reimagine what the, what, what the daily lessons look like. And a lot of it is relationship building, and so I think once a week they have what they call coffee club, and the students brew coffee and they serve it to the elders. Um, and not only is that relationship building, which spurs off a whole bunch of amazing conversations, but the students are learning about the country where the coffee came from. They're learning about the production of these things. So I think they're really, I mean, I, this is a huge, a huge shift and a huge challenge for teachers and also a big burden. And so I don't think we can reimagine and pivot on a dime, <clears throat> excuse me, but I think moving outside of the classroom, thinking about the ways in which education is all around us it's not really or merely in worksheets um is is everywhere is kind of a bold call for what education could look like definitely and that just sounds so exciting doesn't yeah, it definitely. i mean to all the teachers definitely. here wouldn't that be the coolest yes, thing yes, yes to be able to completely shake it up and have a, a a whole different learning environment with other people of different generations all supporting one another i mean it's like a and dream. The community has rallied around this program and it's incredible to see like high school students, or, sorry, high school teachers who meet these folks years later when they're six, seven years older can say, I can pinpoint first day of class who was in this program and who wasn't because they have this comfort and fluency interacting with other people, the sense of social responsibility that, you know, comes from outside of the classroom sometimes. Um, so it's, it's really incredible to watch. Yeah. And, and Lisa, I'm, I'm not going to pick on you from a professional point of view now, but I am going to pick on you as a as a mom. Um, how, do, how do you as a mom, you know, when you're aware that um, there are catch up requirements, literacy, I think your children are exactly that kind of age where literacy and numeracy loss is is kind of being measured. Um, how would you respond to your school leadership if you, you know, in, in this context of kind of social emotional learning versus this investment in catch up? Yeah. So, so just for perspective, my, my, I have three of the ages of five, seven and nine who attend a public school in Brooklyn. And so all the principles that you guys are talking about here is exactly what I've been seeing this public school take on. So Luca, your point about interaction, like they're all intermingled together. If the, the concept of a morning meeting where children are going through their agenda, there is always a question of how are you and how are you feeling? What that's on a Monday and how was your weekend? On a Friday, it is a matter of let's reflect on the week. So even as children are learning, are planning their academic curriculum for the day, it is incorporated into the conversation of let's reflect which part was great, which part was wonderful, what was good about the weekend, things of that sorts. Uh, the kindergarten teacher in uh, when we first went into um, virtual learning, the kindergarten teacher would start every single day off with a song from like the 1990s. I, I mean, I would just sit there in tears next to the five-year-olds who is gonna brace and like believe that it's gonna be okay because I've got the song playing for me. And then we'll go on and learn about math theory and how to add and subtract. But the state of mind, which this five-year-old was now doing it with, was completely different in a virtual environment and a computer and a screen that he still had to digest what that means. And I've seen it across the board from all of his friends. And the, the whole notion of these new innovations with teaching, you know, whether you're innovating products or you're innovating um, 
teaching concepts, there has to be an element of support and encouragement. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so important when a teacher is encouraged to innovate mm -hmm. new ways of teaching, then you unleash the teachers. Mm -hmm. And when you, I've seen that happen, they redefine all of it, all of it, and it's incredible. So this is without a doubt, a pivotal moment for the industry, again, just as a parent of what I witnessed because of this post pandemic world that the kids are coming out of. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, we are running out of time, so I'm just going to go quickly along the panel. Um, we had some incredible ministers here earlier. We've met some um, people today who have been part of the kind of top level discussions about transforming education. If you had to leave one message to them based on this conversation, what would that be? Are we starting down here? We'll start yeah. down there. I'll take the visual yeah. view. Yeah. Um, I think I, I I think supporting well-being and and happiness is is shouldn't be secondary. I think it should be a top priority for supporting students. I think the data strongly demonstrate the importance of of this as kind of a, a safe base for students to learn beyond, you know, to, to learn the curriculum, but learn beyond and, and what we want in global citizens and forward thinking and supporting the environment and supporting relationships. Thank you, Lisa. I'm, I'm sure there's data to back it up, but I'll speak more from the heart than anything else. Ha happier people are smarter people and that can probably be quantified and qualified in many different ways. And so it matters. I can send you the papers. Yeah. yeah <laughs> um, Luca? My question, mine's a question. What okay. really matters most when we get to the end of something, even our lives perhaps, and it's not, how well we did on a standardized examination. It's going to be the difference that we made, the connections that we had, how able we were to reform, relearn across our lifespan. And so social emotional learning really is such a powerful vehicle and it is an enormous investment that any system, any school, any community, any educator, any parent can make, I think, in, in the growth of young person to meet their potential. Thank you. And Rachel? And just to just to follow up on that, um, I'm just thinking, has anyone seen the Amal puppet, little Amal walking through New York? I had a hug from her. Oh, you are lucky. You got that hug. Well, you know, I think as I reflect on this question, my mind automatically ran to little Amal. And what little Amal has represented, I think, is very synonymous with what stakeholders are feeling. So our children, our teachers, our parents we're feeling unsure, we're feeling apprehensive, we're feeling worried. You know, it's a plethora of emotions that we are literally facing. And when I look at Amal's mannerisms, you know, she, she does a couple of things, you know, she stops, she looks and she listens. Mm -hmm. And I think if we were to just take those three words back to our leaders and policymakers and just remind them, just stop, just look, and listen, I think they would gain a lot of insight that would strengthen the need for the development of social emotional learning. So. Amazing. And Rory, the last word has to go to you. I just want all stakeholders to remember that at all points, when discussing numerical and, uh, and literal, uh, numer numeracy and literacy are very, crucially important skills that people must learn, that children must learn from a young age. But I argue, and I'm pretty sure we can all collectively argue that mental health must be started. The topic of mental health must be started at the same time as learning how to read and write. Because if we are learning at the age of maybe 14 or 15 and we are only seeing a book definition, which is what I saw, <clears throat> I first saw it when I entered secondary school. And by then it was too late. I just saw teachers reading from the book, what is anxiety? What is mental health? That is simply not enough. We need to be familiarized and we must understand from a young age what mental health, well being, and happiness is. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, I actually don't think I can sum it up better than you did. So I think we'll close the panel now. Um, really, 
really um, huge thanks for your time. Very conscious that we've gone over. There is some uh, lunch in boxes outside if you are hungry. I'm sure you are. Oh, it's at the back, actually. Um, so please grab it. If you want to stay, I think the room is available for about 15 minutes. Um, but please, can we just give a round of applause to the panel? Before you go, just five minutes. If I can take your time before you go, just five minutes. We have one more person who is uh, coming here, sharing her cause. And uh, Simran, can I invite you here to uh, share what uh, your cause is? And we have to end this panel with a call for action. So I think it's coming from a young person. I think that's the best way to end uh, today's session. Simran, if you can come here and maybe for five minutes, you can share. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Simran Seth, a sophomore business student at Boston University but I'd rather introduce myself through my mission of advocating for a better well being of humans and the planet. Fashion has always been my passion, but lately it's been sustainability that has my attention. Ever since I was a young girl, I would turn to clothes to boost my self esteem and feel more confident with the outfit I was wearing. Mm -hmm. However, I don't think our environment feels confident when we make an unsustainable choice. I used to be a frequent purchaser of big and reputable fashion brands at a mall nearby, which spells convenient shopping. You see it, you like it, you buy it. A guilt-free indulgence. I always had high hopes from these brands because they had the financial power to be socially responsible, and care for their workers and the environment. But sadly, this isn't the case. When I did an exploratory research essay in my university on what the fashion industry teaches us, I was shocked to read the facts about fast and cheap fashion that came at the expense of the environment and people's livelihoods. These facts completely changed my perspective on fashion and today I hope they do for you as well. I, as I did more research, I realized I needed to make more conscious decisions and look at fashion companies closely before I make a purchase from them. At this point, I would like to thank Columbia University for giving me an opportunity to speak my thoughts in five minutes. But do you know what also happened in the last five minutes? 600 thousand pieces of clothing have been thrown out. And why is that? It's because of us. Because we have chosen to buy more and wear less. We have chosen to wear clothes only seven to 10 times. And I too am guilty of this. But we need to fix this. It is incredibly necessary to be more circular with fashion. And one way to make this happen is to create action with at least one of the seven R's. Repair, reduce, reuse, rent, repurpose, recycle, and resale. I hope that has given you some food for thought, but before I go away, I have a question for you. Do you know where all the clothes go if they aren't unsold? Unsold stock in good condition can end up going to landfills or even end up being burned. And this has happened many times by major stores where you've spent a lot of time and money in, but unfortunately they have prioritized exclusivity and profits over people and the planet. I'm often asked about what one can do individually to tackle this crisis. Well, a step we can take moving forward is evaluating and rethinking our relationship with fashion and shopping and label it less as an activity or as a hobby. For example, spending your Saturday afternoon simply going to the mall and stocking up on your wardrobe without purpose is not cool. It's important to recognize your purchasing decisions and whether they're purposeful or impulsive. This is what make, can make companies 
reform when we use our purchasing power and decisions to support longevity over quick fixes in fashion. We have the power to change the devastating direction the fashion industry is leading us towards. Today, you can transform your mindset on fashion. In the end, all I'd like to say is for your style to be maintained, this earth must be sustained. Thank you. Thank you all for your time and to Columbia University, especially Radhika, who has given me this platform to highlight an urgent issue in our world. Thank you. Let's be mindful of our consumption and waste that we generate. And that's a good call for action to end the day. Uh, please have this food and then there is uh, you know beverage and other things. Please hang around, network, meet new people, combine, form relationships with happiness as well as ESD and let's make our world better with our actions. Thank you for coming today. Thank you.